And when you answered it, a, there was a little pause, and then a voice, when you said hello, a voice came on, and it seemed like there was a script being read, and they were asking you for something, usually your money. And how many of you have had it happen during dinner time, right? At dinner time. Yeah, a lot of you have. Seems like that's always when they call me. I've learned that whenever my caller ID reads unavailable or out of the area, I just don't even answer it. But isn't it something that isn't it something that it just doesn't happen on the telephone anymore? It happens everywhere. It happens in the mail or on email. People are everywhere relentlessly hitting us up for money. Isn't that something? And what is interesting is that if you fail to give, I've learned this, if you fail to give the telemarketers what they ask for, they'll either hang up on you rudely or make you feel real guilty a lot of times. They also pray upon the compassion of others. You notice on TV, with pictures of suffering people or animals. Or they appeal to pride with a false sense of hope for winning millions of dollars. And so people today are confused. I, I'm reminded of a little senior lady who was on a fixed income who spent hundreds of dollars on videotapes because a magazine company made her believe if she ordered the tape, she would win the grand prize. Folks, this hits on. I remember back several years ago, down, my, uh, my, my two great aunts lived together, elderly uh, uh, ladies. I remember them telling me one day when I was down here vacationing at the beach. I remember them telling me, oh, Don, we want you to plan to be down here on such and such a day. I said, why? Because something wonderful is going to happen. And it's going to be a blessing, not only for us, but it'll be a blessing for everybody. We're going to help you and everybody else when this special day happens. And I said, really? And they said, yes, I'm thinking, what happened is, though, did they strike oil here in Carolina Beach or what? You know? I wonder, what is going on? Well, a little bit later, they, sh they shared it with me. They let me read the letter from Publishers Clearing House. And on this particular day, the prize patrol was coming to their door. And they even had received multiple letters. And they had received a business card from the vice president of the company saying that, yes, she was going to be there personally to reward them that money. And all they had to do was keep buying things from them. And my poor aunt bought nearly a thousand dollars worth of videotapes. The problem is she didn't even have the VCR. <laughs> so I dealt with that and it was during that time that Congress calling them up in front of them about their tactics and uh, they ended up refund refunding her money. Thank the Lord that I was there to do it. But a lot of, a lot of little older ladies didn't have someone to go to bat for them. Hell and markers. Or how about the millions of people who go by the convenience stores everywhere, gas stations, convenience stores, to buy lottery tickets with money that they cannot afford to lose. Because the world keeps saying, you could be the winner. Let me tell you who the real winner is. The real winner is the person who trusts God and follows His plan and is experiencing real blessings. Let me tell you that no one can outgive God. And when we live our lives, and when we give our lives according to His grace and divine purpose, then out of His abundance we are blessed. And that's the promise of God. Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all the things you need will be added to you. Today I want to look at the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. And see one more time what God has in store for people who follow Him. Now I know the Lord is going to finish this series. And I thought we were already finished. But the Lord wanted me to share another message. And I will too. He says stop. And uh, so I know we're going to do it today. And then what I'm going to do after the Lord finishes this series. 
I'm going, to, I'm going to bring another series of messages that he's been speaking to me about on how we build healthy relationships. And so that's coming up in the days uh, in the days ahead. This morning I've asked Caleb Prinkle, one of our young, fine young men in the church, to come and read this uh, passage and lead us in the reading of God's Word. Would you stand with me as I continue to bring you the message, God's plan for Starting in verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the seeds of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and for us to be able to come here and learn about you and worship you, Lord. And I pray that you'll help us see the blessings that you give us on a daily basis, Lord, and that we'll take Pastor Donnie's sermon to heart and we'll live it out in our lives after we walk out of these doors, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friend. Boy, what a great prayer. Aren't you proud of our young people? I can hear God's plan for blessing. Well, for the last month, we've been studying God's Word to see what the Lord would say to us about the blessings, His blessings, that are available to His people. And from the teachings of the Bible, we've been learning about blessings. I have. From the Lord Jesus, we learned that God is the provider of all true blessings and that God has a plan for all true blessings. And that, that plan is that blessings are a means of fulfilling our task assigned by the Lord. Blessings are a mean of means of measuring our love for the Lord. And blessings are a means of rewarding our faithfulness to the Lord. From God's Word to Jabez, we learn that to receive the blessings of God, we must pray with a godly passion and pray with a godly purpose. From God's Word to Moses, we learn that to receive the blessings of God, we must walk in obedience to His Holy Word and and. Uh, in our worship and witness, and we must listen to the voice of God and long for His glory. In our scripture passage this morning, we continue our series on God's plan for blessing as we learn from the Apostle Paul how true, how, how true faith is a giving faith, and a giving faith results in blessing. He tells this to the church at Corinth. Now the city of Corinth was a city in Greece which was known for its great architecture and Isthmian games, competitions, which were held every two years in the year before and after the Olympics to honor the sea god Poseidon. In these games, athletes and musicians competed in boxing, wrestling, chariot races, and musical and poetic contests. To honor their false sea god Poseidon. When the Romans conquered Corinth in 146 BC, they killed most of the Greek male population and they sold the women and children into slavery. And this city of Corinth lay desolate for a little more than a century when in 44 BC Julius Caesar decided to establish a colony, a Roman colony there. He kept the games, of course. But Roman, he established Roman laws and culture, building programs between the reigns of Augustus and Nero made Corinth a modern and powerful city, an economic center of that day at the time of Paul. About one-third of the population consisted of slaves. 
as Corinth was a main depot of slave trade in the region. Corinth in that day was one of the wealthiest cities in the ancient world. And men were flaunting their wealth and using it to advance up the social ladder. Immigrants from all over the eastern Mediterranean region came to work in the thriving economy. There was a social battle waging between the rich while another class of people were living in poverty. A second century writer explained why he did not like the crowd of Corinth. He wrote, and I quote, I learned in a short time the nauseating behavior of the rich and the misery of the poor. Now, it was in this climate of arrogance, politics, and idolatry that Paul made his first journey to Corinth, and he tried to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. He went into the synagogue. Luke wrote in Acts chapter 8, after this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, Paul's a tent maker, he stayed with them and worked. And he reasoned in the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior. But when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the Word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ, the Messiah, was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And I'm glad he did, because that's who we are today, Gentiles. We're not Jews. And he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. That's how the Corinthian church was born, in the middle of that wealthy, so wealthy they flaunted their wealth, that wealthy city. So Paul planted this church in one of the wealthiest and yet immoral cities of the ancient world, a world where success meant money and fame, and there was a fight to the top. And therefore, inside the church, there were people of different social and monetary status, statuses, and there would soon be divisions in the church. See, those of, of wealth were exerting their prominence in the church, insisting that they were in charge because of their great blessings from God. And Paul would write to, to the Corinthians. He wrote 1 Corinthians to deal with this attitude of arrogance and to this disunity that it was causing when one family or one group of people began to try to gain control of the church of God. And folks, that happens a lot in churches even today. And Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to deal with this disunity. And, and he wrote another Corinthian letter that has been lost to us. So there are actually three Corinthian letters, but we only have two of them. He sent Timothy from Ephesus to Corinth with the first letter. The result was that those who grappled for power resisted Paul's letter and tried to attack his character. Paul told them that although they have 10,000 instructors, they have only one father in the faith, and that was he was the one that had birthed them through the gospel. And because of these developments in that Corinthian church, Paul decided to visit Corinth on his next journey. But he could not because of what was happening in his world around him. So he wrote this sorrowful letter that we call 2 Corinthians. He told the Corinthians that he longed to see them again, but his life was put in such danger in Asia that only God could deliver him. In 2 Corinthians 1 he wrote, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised us from the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and 
does deliver us and whom we trust that he will still deliver us, you also help him together in prayer for us. That thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift of mercy granted to us through many. Paul sent this letter, St. Corinthians, through Titus. Remember Titus? Titus Justus. The one who was one of the first to believe the truth in Corinth. Well, Paul, well, Titus traveled with Paul. And Paul sent him home with 2 Corinthians to make sure the people of his hometown received this letter and, and to revive their effort, effort at gathering and sending and offering to the Jerusalem church. See, that's what this was about. In, in Paul had told the Corinthian church about the need back in Jerusalem. He said in 1 Corinthians 16, he said, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, what's the first day of the week? Sunday, when the church gathered for worship, just like we are today. On the first day of the week, every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come, so that you won't have to take an offering when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gifts to Jerusalem. The Christians in Jerusalem were in trouble. You remember the church in Jerusalem? That was the mother church. It was from Jerusalem that every other church was born. We're here today because of Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church. Remember in the upper room after Jesus had died and risen from the dead and ascended into heaven and told his disciples, stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. They were gathered in that upper room to pray and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came down like a mighty rushing wind. They heard a sound of thunder, sound like a freight train coming and the Holy Spirit just fell upon every one of those in that room and that you could tell because it was it looked like little flames of fire on the top of everyone's head. And they began to speak there, and they were speaking in different languages and hearing in different languages. And then Peter got up and Peter preached the gospel. And thousands were filled on that were, thousands were saved on that first day. The church was baptized, was immersed in the Holy Spirit. And from that moment on, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell every person who believes in Jesus. And He immerses us with eternal life. From that upper room, that's where the church in Jerusalem was born. And churches everywhere were born as the Jerusalem church sent missionaries out around the world. Now the church in Jerusalem was suffering. Famine had struck the land. And they couldn't get food. There was, there was a constant persecution in Jerusalem of Christians. An economic disaster due to war and fighting. Paul and Barnabas had initially taken a relief offering to Jerusalem from the church in Antioch in, in 45 AD, 46 AD. The Jerusalem church was grateful for that offering and they prayed that all the churches would Remember their fellow brothers in Judea who were suffering. So Paul began enlisting support from the churches he had planted. And for 10 years, Paul worked at gathering an offering for the Jerusalem church. And in 57 BC, he did take what was collected from the churches to Jerusalem. In, in Romans 16, Paul told the believers in Rome, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? That if we've been blessed by others, we should bless others. That's what Paul was telling us. That's a principle of the Christian life and blessing. That as we've been blessed, we should bless others. And so in 2 Corinthians, Paul is reminding the Gentile believers in Corinth of the need that they have to give to help others. 
And in that, in giving, they would reveal their faith and they would receive God's blessings. And that's what we see in chapter 8 as we get ready for 9. Look at chapter 8 for just a moment. Paul said these words, verses 1 through 7, 2 Corinthians 7. Brothers, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, willing to give, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And not only as we have hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. As you grow in your faith, church, as you grow in your faith, so grow in your willingness to help others come to know the Lord. As you grow in your faith, so be willing to use what God has given you to touch the lives of others. Now some people don't like it when the church talks about money. I do not often talk about giving. I have people say, the pastor, y'all talk about tithing and giving. I don't do it a whole lot. I think tithing and giving is actually comes out of a, out, is actually an outflow out of the heart that is where it needs to be with God. So, if you really are where you need to be with God, you don't have any trouble being a gift. That's what, that's what I really believe in. So I don't preach a whole lot about it. I'm not afraid to preach about it. But I, because I, and today I preach about it because you see, today young Christians are not being taught to be givers. They're not. They're not learning it from their, their parents because most parents today are not teaching their children anything about the Lord. On the contrary, it's my own observation that many parents are teaching their children that God is not the most important part of their lives. And the church is not even important at all. Friends, if church is not important, then Christ is not important. Hear me now. If church is not important, Christ is not important. Because the church is the body of Christ. And the church exists to worship and serve Him. Children copy what they see in their parents. And if their parents, if their parents don't come to church, then they will grow up with that same pattern. And if they don't worship with the church, then they won't serve, they certainly will not give to and through the church. And so believers need today, believers need to be taught to give. Paul said on the first day of every week, that's something. Each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. As God has blessed him, he is to bless others. If I could only help every Christian understand that giving it is absolutely necessary to the Christian life, and I'm not just talking about money. Every part of the Christian life should be about giving. And giving, listen to me, giving always, always, always brings the blessings of God. Now notice with me what we see. We realize from Paul's letter to St. Corinthians in these chapters that Christian giving is a visible sign of our faith in God. Now what is the, what is the formula for salvation? The Bible tells us to feed to it, to it. God's grace plus our faith equals blessing. That's what it is. God's grace plus our faith equals blessed. The reason this holds true is because every part of salvation and the Christian life is owed to God's grace. But unless we believe it, we will not receive it. But if we believe it and receive it, we will act upon it in obedience. And that's what James said. Remember James, the half-brother of Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, who watched Jesus grow up in his home? He was Jesus' half-brother. 
He didn't believe at first, but later on, after Jesus ascended into heaven, James believed. Or maybe after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to James, and James believed. You know what James said? Faith without works is dead. Dead alone. Faith was not meant to be alone. Faith is always accompanied by good works. True faith is accompanied by good works. And so it is in the realm of blessing. Faith moves us to believe God for everything we need and motivates us to give out what we believe God can and will do according to His Word. If we're going to receive anything from God, we have to be people of faith. Faith is everything. And faith is what drives the giving of ourselves to God. And by giving, I mean every part of you. Whether it be giving God our time in worship and prayer, our talent in helping others grow. That's why God has gifted you with spiritual gifts and gifted me so that we can help each other grow in the Lord, grow in our faith. We are called not only to lead people to Christ, we are called to help disciple them to become active in their faith or in teaching <clears throat> or in building up the church of God. We are to give us our treasures which support the ministries and missions of God's church. All that we give to God is for the purpose of encouraging and building up His church. Paul encouraged the Corinthian church to help to give to help others. Friends, missions is at the heart of God's purpose for His church. Paul was raising money in Corinth to help people at Jerusalem. We need to give here at Calvary to help people in other places. Friends, we've got to get to that place where we can do more and give more to missions. We've got to get there. And that means we have to work together to do it. We have to have the proper attitude toward giving that would motivate us to give of ourselves, to build up the church, so that together we can help others. And that's what we learned from Paul's instruction to the Corinthian church. Notice first of all, he teaches us that blessings come with an attitude of grace. Verses 1 through 5 of chapter 8 are that beautiful That's the beautiful testimony of what happens when believers act out their faith in the Lord. The Apostle Paul said there was grace in the attitude of these young believers who gave to help others, to help advance the kingdom of God by supporting not only the ministers of God, but other churches that were struggling. In verse 1 he said, we make known to you the grace of God. You know, grace is a key word that appears ten times in these two chapters. Grace is unmerited favor. It's not grace. It's not paying someone for what they do. It is giving to someone who has done nothing to earn it. That's what grace is. That's why Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says about our salvation. For by grace are you saved. God gave it to you you didn't deserve. You couldn't earn it. For by grace are you saved through faith. Belief in Jesus Christ. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The same attitude God displayed when He offered us salvation is the same attitude we should have when we give of ourselves. In verse 3, Paul said, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Notice that. Verse 2, That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of of their, of their liberality. You know what Paul was saying? They gave out of their, they gave out of their, of what they've been blessed with, they gave out of their abundance and they gave out of their poverty. They gave when they had a lot and they gave when they had very little. They gave with joy. Now that's one thing to give out of abundance. If we have plenty in, we give that's evidence of a generous spirit. But if we give out of our poverty, that's a real example of grace, don't you think? Think of when's the last time you gave out of your poverty? And yet Paul said these young believers gave freely even though they themselves had need. The key word is willing. That is the proper attitude that should be behind every gift that we can give to the Lord. In verse 9, he told us about our example. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that through, though He was rich yet for your sakes He became poor that you through His poverty 
I become rich. What Jesus gave was unspeakable. Indescribable. He was the Lord of glory, surrounded by angels who sang His praises unceasingly. He was the creator uh, and controller of the universe. He was the source of life, and yet He gave it all up for us. He came to a people whom He had created, and He died for us on the cross. He created blood to flow in His veins, and then He allowed it to be poured out to pay for our sin. Jesus gave the greatest offering ever given. He gave all of Himself. And the result was blessing for us. Eternal life and heaven for us. A future secured for us. We are rich because of His gift. Jesus wasn't thinking of Himself when He went to the cross. You were on His mind. And I was on His mind. Jesus died for us so that we could be saved. And that is the attitude that we need that will bring the blessings of God. The same attitude that Jesus had. Notice what, what Paul said in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So that each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know what that is? A cheerful giver. That's an attitude of grace. Now, we should remember that even though they gave, Paul made it clear that, those, that Macedonian church was still suffering. Giving of ourselves to God does not remove all the suffering we may face, but it does open our hearts to God's purposes and to others. It helps us see beyond ourselves, and it does bring God pleasure to see His children following His example. Jesus was the greatest giver that's ever lived. And we ought to follow His example. Amen. And furthermore, when the Macedonian churches gave in spite of persecution and poverty, Paul said they experienced an abundance of joy. Sometimes the blessings of God come in the form of joy and spiritual strength. The blessings of God come to those who are cheerful about giving. Cheerful is an attitude. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 15, 10, God said, you, you shall give to Him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to Him. Because for this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. In the Old Testament and the New, God promised to bless those who give cheerfully. Now, if God promised it, don't you think God will keep His promise? I do. And if we give grudgingly, as if we don't really want to, if we take the attitude, I'll give if I have to, God will not bless us for that. Friends, just think about how much God has given you Every time you have an opportunity to give you just about, just think of all the things God has given you. Just think. Every time you have an opportunity to give to someone else, just remember all the things God has given you. Every time you give your offer to the church, think about that. Every time you give an hour of work to the Lord. Every time you want to leaders listen to little children sharing their Bible verses they've memorized. Every time you unlock these doors, security team, every time you drive that van, that transportation team, every time you cook that meal, bereavement team and fellowship team, and every time you do anything, youth leaders and children's leaders and adult leaders and senior leaders and choir members and praise band members, any time you do anything, think about how much God has given you. Just think about it. If our heart is right with God, then we will not be reluctant. We will not worry about giving it to God. We will say, Lord, I trust you to take care of me, and I will give what you ask me to give because I'm grateful for your grace. And when you're holding those little babies in the nursery, and we all ought to take a turn to do doing that, I would if I wasn't here preaching. Because when you hold that little baby in the nursery, and that little baby cannot even say thank you, that's an act of grace. Can I hear an amen? We ought not be grudging about anything that we have to give. We ought not worry. Because we ought to be able to say, God, my life's in your hands. And I give it to you. You use like you choose. And remember, we're a New Testament people. So God said, 
God said, as God has already prospered you, you give. God knows how much He's given you. What, what you do between what you do with what God's given you is between you and God. What He's given me, that's between me and God. But like a group of mountain climbers, we are tied together in the service of God. See, for safety reasons, mountain climbers rope themselves together as they're climbing the mountain. So that if one climber should slip and fall, he would not fall to his death. But he would be held to the others until he could regain his footing. So we in the body of Christ are held together by cords of grace. So that if one of us loses faith, we can hold him up until he regains his footing and starts giving of himself again friends. That's why you need to come to church. You're important. You are important to me. You are important to those people around you. And to those Christians around our community and around our world. We want you to be strong and we want you to be blessed. And finally, blessings come as the evidence of faith. Look what Paul said in verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. If you, if, if you take seed, Paul said, if you take seed and you throw it out, if you take a little handful and you throw it out on the yard, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a patch of grace. But if you take a, a cedar, a spreader, and you fill that thing with a bag of seed, and you go through your yard and you spread that stuff all over the place, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get a lawn full of grass. The question is, where do we see the greatest evidence of our faith? We see it in the result. God is the one who gives the result. God is the one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. God is the one who gives us what we have. So that we can give to others. And the result is that we might have an abundance for every good work. See, giving is the means of seeing God's work accomplished. We all contribute of our time and talents and treasures. Everybody in the family of God. So that God's purposes are fulfilled. And unless we all give, then something is not going to get accomplished. We're in it together. That's why I pray for you over and over again. I write down your names and I pray for you. That's why I encourage you to be faithful. Because what you do does impact me. It does impact that person beside of you. It does impact this church. And it impacts people around this world. Believers everywhere. What you do matters. As a church, we have one mission. To reach out with the message and love of Christ and bring others to Him. It takes effort. It takes hard work to do this. I know there are many here today that give offerings. Church. I know. I never see what people give. But I know that every cent that comes in this church goes to pay all the bills and goes through the budget and pays all those things that we said were important. Every cent is used for exactly what we said was important to this church and the mission of God. But I wonder how many of us are given our effort to invite people to join us in the mission. How many are using our voices and our blessings to help others know Christ? God's principle of blessing is true, and it is God's principle. The more we give, the more we will be given by God to share with others. But if we're blessed by God and we don't use those blessings to further His kingdom for good works, then we will not receive more the next time. You see, God wants to bless us so that we will have more to give to advance the gospel. And that's why Paul urged the Corinthians to give their spiritual gift of their talents and their time and their prayers, because as Paul said in verse 12, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, it's good for the whole church, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Generosity, giving of blessings already received will result in thanksgiving to God. I have, like I told you, as we give of ourselves for the work of God, others will see it. And they will be thankful. How many times I've read of how our Baptist men and women go to disasters and set up feeding units and shower units. And when we go, as we did in the Gulf Coast with Katrina and New York City after 9-11, the people say this when they see those shirts that say North Carolina Baptist. There come those Baptists. We are so grateful. We should pass me. Of course, Pat doesn't. That was a blessing to feed all those hungry people. You and Jim used to go down there, didn't you? The Gulf Coast. 
we should all be known by the people that know us as those who give cheerfully. For God loves and blesses those who give. Verse 6. He, this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So how is your faith being displayed? Willingly or grudgingly? Is it displaying God's grace and your faith to others? And are you experiencing God's blessings? Because you know you are being true to God's will for you. A humanitarian group in Africa noticing the filthy water, sewage, and disease built clean water and sewage system. They built a clean water and sewage system for a little village in Africa. And months later, they visited that village. But when they came to that village again, it was about square one with filthy water and sewage and disease. The chief of the village told the humanitarian workers, what did you expect? These people had been many years without clean water. And then you gave it to them for free in abundance. They took all they could use and more. The people did not work for those water stations. They do not own them. And they could not be persuaded to maintain them. The humanitarians were silent. The chief had spoken the truth. The great gift alone had not been enough. And the reasons could be clearly observed. See, they took, but they didn't give back. It was observed clearly. Perhaps it's human nature to abuse and give. The humanitarians returned to their tent and thought long and hard about how they could help the villagers. And, and they, the next day, they, they came back determined to rebuild the water and sanitation systems for the following conditions. Number one, the villagers would have to pay for water and sanitation not more than they could afford, but there would be no gift giving at this time. And number two, a group of villagers would work with the contractors to build the system and would be taught how to repair every aspect of it. These villagers would in turn train others, but the system would never fall in disrepair. With these new conditions in place, the water and sanitation systems were restored, and this time the people had respect for the systems because they owned them. And this time they were able to repair the system when it broke down. And to do this, friends, listen, God could do the same with our blessings. He could stop blessings if we allow His blessings to go unused for the building up of His church and the advancement of His kingdom. And He could stop blessing us with more until we use what He has given us as He intends. So do what God wants and use your blessings for His glory that it may bring thanksgiving and honor to the one who blesses us abundantly. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. With our heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. If you would just for a moment just allow God to speak to your heart. My question is, are you doing what God wants you to do with what He's given to you? Whether it's your time, what you have, or are you using, I'm not saying you can't have more time than everybody else has. Everybody has the same amount of time. Are you allocating it like God wants you to allocate it? Are you doing something with your time so that God is glorified with you? I know you are when you're in worship. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and worship. No doubt your talent. Are you serving the Lord the way God wants you to serve Him? Maybe you need to come be a part of this church and say, it's time for me to join this church so that I can really get involved and be part of the, of the climb here. We're climbing toward God's, to fulfill God's mission like those mountain climbs. I need to be on the road with everybody else. Maybe that's something you need to do. Or maybe just be faithful. Come and be faithful to God. Or maybe if there's something you need to do to serve the Lord. If you need a place to serve, just ask. I'll, I'll be glad to have you find a place to serve the Lord. Maybe you need to be faithful with your treasures. Because I know that God has given us everybody we need. And if we'll be faithful, 
we'll be able to accomplish all that he wants us to do as a church in ministry and missions. So are you faithful in all these things? What does God want you to do today? Maybe you need Jesus as your Savior. Why don't you pray with him and say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for me. To pay for my sins. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead to give me eternal life. Right now I ask you to come into my life. Save me. Give me eternal life. And I will follow you for the rest of my life, the rest of my days. I want to do what you want me to do. And I want to use what you bless me with to help others. Lord, thank you for your sweet spirit in this place. As we sing, Lord, would you draw people closer to yourself. We might give more and more of ourselves to you. We won't hold anything back. But we will let our gifts, our giving of ourselves be an example of an attitude of grace and a display of faith. In Jesus' name, amen.